Hello again. Here we are, another Insights Lecture. Thank you for welcoming us into your home, office, or wherever you're tuning in. We're practically old friends at this point, but in case you don't know me, my name is Joe Komsky, and I'm the Senior Director of Philanthropy at Sanford Burnham Preface. Today's topic is neurodegenerative diseases, specifically Alzheimer's. We're going to hear some statistics about how this is a growing problem around the world on a macro level. But let's talk about it on a micro level for a moment. My father suffered from frontal temporal dementia associated with his ALS 30 years ago. In some ways, it was a blessing and a curse, as perhaps he wasn't as aware of what was happening to him as he deteriorated. My grandmother suffered from dementia at the end of her life in her 90s. And my stepfather suffered from Alzheimer's very severely at the end of his. For many of you tuning in today, this is very personal. Someone you know and love suffers or suffered from dementia. This disease affects your loved one, but also you and everyone else in your family. And we grieve for our loss before our loved one is physically gone. Today, we want to offer you hope. There are people out there, like the scientists you will meet today, who are working tirelessly to solve this problem. You are not alone. Many of us are aware of the recent news about aducanumab, a drug that may reduce clinical decline in Alzheimer's patients by attacking beta amyloid plaques in the brain. Many of you will have questions for our researchers about this drug and they will try to provide answers. But you will also hear from them about the treatments that will come next, the next generation that will be better and more effective. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to ask questions at any time. We will present those questions to our speakers at the end of their presentation, and we'll bring everyone back at the end for more discussion and answers. Our first speaker today is Dr. Gerald Chun. Gerald is a professor in our Degenerative Diseases Program and the Senior Vice President for Neuroscience Drug Discovery here at Sanford Burnham Previs. He is one of the world's leading Alzheimer's disease researchers and conducts leading edge research on the disease. Dr. Chun, welcome to Insights. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And let me start by getting my screen going. And I hope you're all doing well and thank you uh, for joining us. And in the next 10 minutes, I'll take you through a bit of the science uh, that we're pursuing. The title of this presentation is Somatic Gene Recombination and Mosaicism in Normal and Alzheimer's Disease Brain. And let's just look at that title for a second because it captures uh, what I'll be speaking about. Somatic means that it occurs in you and not necessarily in your children. That is, it's not a germline change that's passed on from generation to generation, but instead happens uh, just within you. Gene, that's of course the genes that make up uh, uh, all of the different coding or proteins that our body expresses and recombination means that there's a process where you can mix and match pieces of a given gene to form new forms and new copies of those genes. And then mosaicism, that's just like a mosaic where you have different uh, tiles, say that produce a picture, but each one can be a little bit different. So that captures uh, the, the main concepts. And if you look at the diagram in the uh, left portion of the slide, you can see that we have a little tinker toy types of uh, spheres or, or um, uh, pictures of these uh, uh, cylinders. And what these cylinders are, are parts of genes that can be brought together to form a number of different new uh, types of molecules. And one additional thing that's noted is an antibody in colorful uh, schematic fashion. That antibody could be one of the potential drug therapies that you've heard about of late. Of course, there are many that have been uh, pursued over the last number of years. And these tend to be uh, things that tackle just a single species. Whereas if you have a bunch of different species, then you might get a different result. So let me take you then through uh, some of the science and using some analogies along the way to try to uh, get uh, the, the basic ideas across. So here's Alzheimer's disease, most common cause of dementia, huge societal and economic costs. And we still do not understand the sporadic forms of the disease that constitute the vast majority of cases. 
And up until this point uh, in time, there's just one recently approved controversial FDA approved disease modifying therapy, but many, many uh, failed clinical trials that span something like 20 years and based on similar types of uh, procedures to interrupt the disease. However, a very strong signal are the 1% of cases that are linked to three causal genes, APP, PSEN1, and two. The names aren't so important, but these are what are referred to as familial Alzheimer's disease. And it's also seen in Down syndrome and it affects a gene called APP or amyloid precursor protein. And mutations and copies of APP are causal for Alzheimer's disease in these rare cases. And current models assume that mutant genes and indeed all genomes are the same in all cells. So that's the backdrop. If we look at the uh, spectrum of causal and disease genes, uh, that's shown in this nice graph here. And Alzheimer's disease causal, which are up at the top here, piece in one, piece in two, ADP, uh, can be compared to the so-called risk factor genes. And those are all the others that are listed here as a function of the frequency in the population. So some of these are still quite rare like the famous APOE4 uh, genes, but some are very common as well. But importantly, all of these genes were identified by taking samples of DNA from your blood or from your buccal, your cheek, uh, cheek skin cells, excuse me. And all of these uh, do not consider the possibility that in fact, uh, cells within the brain itself might have distinct genomes because if they did, then the actions of these genes might be different from cell to cell. So here we have the brain and it's not just one or two cells, but it's 170 billion cells in your brain. Also, these cells are not identical. So I think for a long time, it was considered that yes, you have a cell in the brain and yes, it's uh, the same. It's kind of like this, this uh, car that was called a Trabant in East Germany. Every single car was the same. This is not a Ferrari, this is not a Tesla. This is just one rather plain looking car. But of course, uh, in reality, the numbers of cells are also complemented by their diversity. And so all of these cells have many, many different types of morphologies and that constitutes uh, all of the cells uh, that make up our brains. And you can uh, draw the analogy further that all of these cells uh, are distinct just like all these colorful cars that make up this rainbow. So that your brain is in effect composed of myriad uh, cells or myriad cars, if you will, uh, each of which is distinct at the level of their DNA. So how does that relate to Alzheimer's disease? Well, in the Alzheimer's disease brain, there are lots of dead cells and there's a lot of debris that one can find. The debris is uh, typically the plaques that you've heard about, so-called senile plaques, and you also have uh, tau tangles. And you can compare that to, for example, uh, the smash cars might be cells that are dead or dying. And then the debris is all the stuff that you see scattered out, whether it's pieces of a car or chunks of stuff that are out here on the side. And you can imagine that if you started to uh, target some of that, just like those antibody therapies, you might get at some of the junk out here, but that doesn't touch a lot of the other things that are going on within the REC. Moreover, uh, all of the uh, therapies aside from that that was just approved are what we call uh, symptomatic therapies. They treat the symptoms such as cholinesterase, cholinesterase inhibitors that you know about. And that'd be uh, akin to treating the smoke and the water that you'd see in this particular REC, but it doesn't get at the net uh, cause of the, uh, the disease. Similarly, uh, we can drill down to look a bit further at the cars that are involved. So here's another REC. And uh, future therapies are really targeting many of these uh, cars and their junk, including the tow trucks that come and take things away, such as TREM2 is pulling uh, things out. That's a, a microglial marker that, uh, or gene that is involved in clearing uh, debris. But, what about the drivers? And so these cars wouldn't have gotten in a wreck in the first place if uh, the drivers had been uh, properly trained perhaps, or maybe were attentive. So there's another element that you can see that is involved and that is often uh, missed, we believe, in thinking about uh, Alzheimer's disease. And what could create a diversity of drivers? It's somatic gene recombination and mosaicism 
that creates the bad drivers. So let me take you through a bit of that science. So within a given cell, uh, we have our double-stranded DNA that's shown here, DSDNA, and then that creates the famous RNA. And some of you know there's a pre-RNA that then gets spliced to form the actual RNA that uh, encodes proteins. And what this pack band is, is a pack band is something that is uh, copying the RNA into a DNA molecule. That DNA molecule can then go back into this double-stranded DNA, but create a new form of a particular copy or gene. And we've referred this, uh, to this as genomic cDNAs or gen cDNAs. Importantly, this Pac-Man process can go back and repeat itself. And these uh, Pac-Man are what are known as reverse transcriptases. They're lousy at copying, so they make a lot of mistakes along the way. And when they do so, uh, you can get a mosaic accumulation of pathogenic mutations. That's those stars that you see. And these turn out to be, at least some of them, identical to what are seen in families, except they're occurring in the common forms of disease. Also, some of these forms may actually form what are called prions to propagate disease, although that's still an idea that's in question. So in Alzheimer's disease, this process goes wild and uh, these reverse transcriptases function, but likely create lots of mutations. And these single nucleotide uh, variations or mutations are produced by reverse transcriptase. And that uh, gives you the opportunity to look at people that might've been exposed to these types of reverse transcriptase inhibitors to block these blue Pac-Men. And those are the HIV patient populations who are now living well past their 60s and are at risk for AD. They are being treated with these inhibitors. So how many in the peer reviewed literature have been reported? And surprisingly, uh, there's just been one case that showed up in 2016. And uh, it appears that even if this were uh, sort of a, a more conservative type of representation of the numbers, that there are very many fewer than one would anticipate based on their demographics. So our brains are in fact a genomic mosaic with its DNA altered by somatic gene recombination as well as other processes. And instead of having single cells that are all identical, we've got this rainbow of distinct cells or distinct cell types and neurons that form our brains and that can be altered in disease. And when perturbed, uh, this could underlie Alzheimer's disease as shown here. Uh, with vast changes in their DNA to produce DNA drivers that uh, are generated by somatic gene recombination. And just to leave you with a little picture of these drivers of the cars, some might be good, some might be bad, and that that could then uh, lead to the diseases uh, that produce neurodegeneration, particularly in this case, Alzheimer's disease. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Joe. Thank you. Gerald, thank you very much. Um, let's, uh, if you do have questions for Gerald right now, please go ahead and use the Q&A button on the bottom of your uh, screen. Gerald, to uh, help me understand some of this, um, I wanna go back to your car analogy, which I thought was was really good. When, you're, when you showed us the Pac-Man, is that analogous to all the distractions and things that you might have when you're, when you're driving is that what it is those the problems that the the pac-man causes would be you know having the radio on so loud and the kids are fighting in the back seat and you got bad training or or you know somebody told you the wrong the wrong things is that a is that a correct analogy or am i not getting it oh right. well well it affects the driver so to speak so anything that affects the the driver of that car that gets into the wreck could be a part of that i think mechanistically we wouldn't want to push it so far because it, uh, a reverse transcriptase has a very uh, precise role, but it could definitely change the nature of that driver. So in that regard, yes, that, that would fit. Okay. And so then the reverse transcriptase, because this is really interesting to me, the reverse transcriptase can then basically fix those, those distractions as we're calling them. I know we don't want to take the analogy too far, but, but the reverse transcriptase um, can, can, can solve some of those problems. And so instead of drugs like the new one out there, which is really just removing the debris from the accident, the reverse transcriptase in the sense is, is creating better drivers. 
Well, well, it, it does both. I mean, it can create good drivers or it can create bad drivers. So it can create Donald Duck or it can create some of the uh, other folks from the far side that you saw there. So um, those are both drivers. Uh, the idea is that you could inhibit, uh, say, the production of the bad drivers in particular uh, if you hit them or hit this reverse transcriptase at the right time. And so that may be what's occurring uh, in the HIV patient populations, but of course we'll need to do prospective clinical trials uh, that, that's hoped for in the future. Okay, and a couple questions from our audience. One is, do humans have genes that naturally produce reverse transcriptase or do they obtain it? Here it says from viral infection, but I think- Yes, yes, no, that's a great- Medicines for it, yeah? It's a great question. So uh, the, the, the medicines were designed to inhibit HIV reverse transcriptase, of course, and they've been around since the 1980s. Uh, they, they work and they do target these uh, enzymes called reverse transcriptases that were in fact first identified in viruses. And this was famous work from David Baltimore and Howard Tiemann back in 1970 or so. But what's really amazing is that about half of our genome today is uh, the, the end product of the actions of reverse transcriptases that have accumulated over evolutionary time. And within our genomes are the remnants and probably active examples of hundreds of thousands of reverse transcriptase genes. They sit in what are known as repeat elements. And in the old days, it was thought to be so-called junk DNA because it's just sitting there not doing anything. Well, it turns out that junk DNA actually encodes some very interesting things, including uh, reverse transcriptases. So there's a huge untapped reservoir of potential reverse transcriptases that we need to understand. And we believe these are the folks that are actually producing disease when they get dysregulated. Thank you. Uh, a couple more questions here. Someone asked about the nature of recombination and if that's affected by lifestyle and or environment. Yeah, another great question. And there's certainly some evidence that you can alter gene expression, which is one of the uh, necessary features of reverse of uh, recombination. It takes transcription of a gene. So yes, absolutely. Anything that can alter gene transcription could then contribute to the recombination process. Similarly, uh, breaks in DNA that you saw in that blue uh, diagram with the blue pack band, uh, those two can be produced by a number of different uh, phenomena, including a whack on the head, for example, or some drugs or some over uh, excitability types of uh, activity. Uh, these have been documented to create DNA strand breaks. So that's another element that, that may be in play. And the last thing, of course, is the reverse transcriptase itself. And there's a whole literature on environmental things that can alter the expression of some of these elements. And it's likely that that could contribute as well. Thank you very much, Gerald. We appreciate it. We will bring you back for some, uh, some other questions at the end. Uh, we do get really intelligent questions from our audience. We have a very intelligent audience. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Tim Wang. Tim is an assistant professor in Sanford Burnham Previs's Degenerative Diseases Program, and he's done extensive research on plaques and tangles that can cause Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Wang, please go ahead. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to introduce some of um, our work from our lab. So basically, we study the Alzheimer's disease risk genes, and we're trying to figure out um, how they can confer um, Alzheimer's and dementia risk. So what is Alzheimer's disease? So basically um, it's an age-related disorder where um, usually um, with the sporadic form as Gerald mentioned, um, individuals start to suffer from uh, dementia and memory problems uh, past age 65. So dementia disorders in general um, are a result of brain failure or some type of, um, they have tr troubles with cognition and other uh, effects of uh, brain failure. So there's other types uh, of dementias, including vascular, Lewy body, and frontotemporal dementia. However, Alzheimer's um, comp comprises the largest proportion of all dementia. So maybe about 50 to 80% of all uh, dementia cases are uh, represented by Alzheimer's disease.
So what defines Alzheimer's disease? What, what makes it, um, what distinguishes it from other types of dementias? So in the early 1900s, um, a German um, physician, a lot of Alzheimer's, so he um, had a dementia patient and he examined her brain post-mortem and he found um, the appearance of these, these, these plaque uh, formations in her brain. And so in the 80s, uh, George Glenner and Colin Masters, basically they identified the main uh, composition of these plaques, uh, which they identified to be a small uh, peptide uh, called beta amyloid or A-beta. So also I also um, noticed the formation of these twisted tangles, which occurs in uh, neurons. Uh, which we now know uh, to be enriched with a modified form of the protein tau. So we call them tau tangles. So although tau uh, pathologies also occur in other dementias, uh, these beta amyloid plaques are specific to Alzheimer's disease. So typically, um, A beta accumulates maybe 10 years or more prior to individuals that will eventually have Alzheimer's or memory loss. So um, in the sporadic form, usually the onset is late. So past age 65, individuals start to have memory problems. But um, 10 years or more before that, we have what's called an asymptomatic or preclinical phase. So the A beta starts to accumulate and it starts to plateau around uh, their mid 60s. And then these individuals will uh, manifest in memory problems and dementia. So this is quite typical. So basically, there's an incubation phase where the A beta starts to build up and starts to plateau up until about age 65. So there's a lot of variability in terms of the A beta profiles with, uh, between individuals. So from various between person to person. So this is a typical profile that I just talked about. So basically there will be a, a asymptomatic preclinical phase uh, before age 65 where A beta builds up. But in other individuals, um, A beta accumulation might start later or maybe not at all. And so these individuals will never see dementia. Um, what's really fascinating, however, is that um, there's also other individuals that have an extended preclinical uh, asymptomatic phase. So basically they start to build up um, maybe a beta in their 40s or 50s. However, uh, despite the increased load of a beta in their brain, they don't see um, any symptoms of memory loss. So a big question that we're trying to answer in the lab is what differentiates between these different profiles? What makes one individual more susceptible to memory loss and another individual uh, with no memory loss, but uh, a huge A beta load? But all, what genes are involved in um, manifesting in individuals that uh, don't have very much A beta in their brain despite their increased age? And so it, the, the end point is to see whether there are gene variants, so different gene types of forms that can delay or prevent Alzheimer's disease. So that's kind of the goal of the lab is to explore whether or not there are gene variants that might be protective for the brain. So one of these gene variants that we study um, is this gene called um, SORLA, or the gene name is called SORL1. And there's gene variants within SORLA that are um, predicted to be loss of function. So basically disrupt um, its, its function. And uh, there's two different types of SORLA mutations that have been identified. Uh, so some of these uh, SORLA mutations, they basically increase the risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. So there's a typical buildup of A, a beta, um, maybe 10 years or more before um, individuals at age 65 start to see memory problems. However, uh, a new, unique feature about this gene is that there's also early onset forms of um, SORLA that have been identified. And so these are rare, uh, but this pushes the uh, timetable forward for these individuals. So basically they start to see memory problems as early as their uh, late 40s, but maybe between 50, age 50 and 64. And so this is saying that SORLA is probably doing something protective. So when you're making a mutation, you're probably disrupting its function. 
And basically, um, when you're disrupting a function, you're increasing your the brain to susceptibility to the increased A beta load. So one question that we asked in the lab is if we increased the amount of SORLA, so if we, if we basically um, enhanced its function, are we able to confer uh, protection to the brain? So the way we do this is uh, we use the mouse model uh, and explore the ability for mice to remember, for example, a platform in a hidden, in, in a swimming pool. So basically we teach the mouse where this, uh, this platform is in the swimming pool. And we're able to ask the question, if we put an extra copy of the SORLA gene into this mouse, and then we inject it with this toxic A beta protein, is it able to uh, remember the location of this platform within this water phase? And so uh, quite astonishingly, um, we found a positive result. So basically, uh, we have a mouse line that has an extra copy of the human SORLA gene, and it can remember um, where this platform is better than a mouse that does not have this extra copy of this gene. So the next step is to figure out why. So basically, what is what, what is SORLA doing? What is this extra copy of this gene doing that's protecting the mouse from this extra uh, beta amyloid we're putting in its brain? And so this is the end game. So what we want to do is we want to find some type of SORLA enhancer. So basically things that might increase its function or pathways that might be related to its upregulation. And the endpoint is basically trying to find perhaps a drug or a protein or some type of enhancer that we can use um, to enhance SORLA function. And we're hoping that uh, this might do a couple of things, maybe protect uh, the brain and neuronal dysfunction from the upregulated um, A beta that um, age, age, age patients might see. And this might retain um, memory function, for example. So um, we're on our way. So we're, we're doing the best we can. So I'd like to thank um, the lab. So this is the lab. Uh, before the pandemic and during the pandemic. And this work was a, a wonderful collaboration between investigators at uh, SBP, so Elena, Barbara, Jin, um, Andrew, and Alex, and as well as UCSD, so Bill and uh, Max Delbrook in Germany. So that's uh, Tom Roma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. And again, we have some questions. I have a question first before we begin, just again, making an analogy so that we can all understand. It seems like these SORLA um, genes are like the, the bouncers or the doormen at the exclusive club that is our brain, right? And if they don't work, then all the, the uh, undesirable guests at the club, which is the, the beta amyloid plaques, can get in um, and so the idea is to increase sort of security like that. Is that, uh, is that fair? You had hit, hit on a very interesting point. So it probably does two things. It's probably the bouncer. So keeping these um, unruly people out. So um, there's, some, there's some evidence from our lab and others that it basically decreases the amount of A beta in the brain. And so um, another function is to, um, you know, protect the people in the club from the, the unruly people that come in. So maybe keeping keeping them in a separate room, maybe that's not, not the best analogy, but they're get, it's basically protected from, even though there's a lot of this A beta around is getting protected. So let's say these unruly people come in, maybe you know the people have helmets on so they don't get uh, injured as much. Got it. A uh, question from our audience about how much more of the SORLA protein is expressed in the mice with the extra gene? Right, so um, that's a very good question. Uh, there's actually quite a bit um, compared to, so this is actually the human gene that we're putting in uh, to the mouse and we're expressing it with a, a strong promoter. So this is a CMV actin promoter. Um, so there's not like uh, a copious amount uh, so sometimes we have troubles uh, detecting it by, um, for example, immunohistochemistry, 
but um, there's enough that uh, maybe I would say probably threefold over what the mouse usually sees. Got it. And are there specific mutations of Sorla? Here's a question that are associated with dementia and can we investigate them individually in the research? Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. So um, there's actually quite a few mutations, uh, different mutations within different spots within the Sorla gene. And um, I think, so, so basically the ones, so, so a lot of them are rare within the, uh, the, the population. So, uh, maybe less than one in a thousand people will, will see these gene variants. And so basically that's what we're, we're interested in studying is, you know, what is the function of each of these mu different mutations within, um, within this gene and how does it affect uh, Alzheimer's dementia? And what's the mechanism? So basically what's going on with these mutations that, um, you know, what, what, what is happening that's not protective within the brain? What's, what's, what are the deleterious effects? And are there other things that we can do to uh, preserve the function of SORLA in our naturally without drugs? So uh, I think the first thing we need to understand is what is happening um, once we disrupt its function. So that's that's kind of like the where we're where we're at in, in this um, in the progression of our investigation. So we're also decrease is able to basically if you disrupt its function basically the beta amyloid does go up um, but that's only one um, clue so we're trying to figure out basically um, if it if the effects come from different cell types so basically does it affect neurons does it affect uh, the immune cell types of the brain which are microglia so uh, once we decipher what exactly is going on with this disruption of the SORLA gene, we're able to better uh, say, well, if we restore these functions, does that have any neuroprotective effects on the AD brain? And then uh, last question for this segment, you talked about um, that asymptomatic A beta plaques can be detected uh, or can accumulate early. Mm -hmm. How would that be discovered in a routine checkup if we don't know that they'll develop into Alzheimer's later in life? Is there is there some way to look for those earlier on? That, that's exactly right. So you, you don't go to the doctor if there's no problems, right? So um, that's the thing is in the clinic, there's a Pittsburgh B compound that they could um, basically uh, visualize the amount of A beta load in the brain. And so um, I don't, I mean, I imagine that uh, there might be other problems that individuals go into the clinic and perhaps um, I'm not quite sure how they actually catch these individuals that have, you know, an increased A beta load despite uh, no, no symptoms because you usually don't go to the clinic if, if you're not sick. Um, but I think basically these large scale studies that also look at um, individuals that don't have any symptoms, I think there are individuals that do have increased A beta, but no symptoms. So um, this is basically looking at, um, you know, control patients. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. We will come back. We'll bring you back at the end. We have some more questions, but we're going to move on now. And so now I'd like to introduce Anna Seta. Anna is the Director of Programs for the Alzheimer's Association in San Diego. And she wanted to share some thoughts on what you've just heard and the impact that Alzheimer's has on our local communities. Anna, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. We are excited to share this information with you all. And um, all of our presenters have done a great job. We're just so excited to listen about more of the research that is being done um, here locally. So at the Alzheimer's Association, we are a voluntary health organization dedicated to Alzheimer's care support and research. We do our best to support um, our care partners and the people living with the disease and those that may have symptoms as well. So the Alzheimer's Association is a global research force. At any given moment, someone somewhere in the world is working to end Alzheimer's. So our mission is to lead the way to end Alzheimer's and all and for all dementias by accelerating global research, driving risk reduction and early detection and maximizing care and support. 
So just wanted just to mention that we uh, are happy to hear that aducanumab, also known as a brand name of Aduhelm, has been approved as a treatment for Alzheimer's by the US Food and Drug Administration. As of last week, I believe, this is the first FDA approval therapy to potentially de de delay decline from the disease compared to current medications that only address symptoms. This is the first therapy to demonstrate that removing amyloid from the brain may de delay decline in people living with Alzheimer's. This is also the first modifying disease that could actually change the course of the disease. I wanted to share that on June 24th, there will be a 30 minute webinar to learn more about aducanumab. The association experts will review what the drug is and how it's administered and what can be expected and who is eligible for this. So more information can be found on our website here, alz.org backslash aducanumab for more information. But for today, I just wanted to mention that um, with the recent announcement, we do have a webpage dedicated through our website, alz.org slash aducanumab for more information. This will be updated as we get more information from Biogen or um, other information than we might have. So the latest, uh, I would encourage you to go and check out our website. But also for more education and community education that we provide both right now virtually and we'll be moving to in-person programming again. Uh, shortly, but we really just try to provide all the information that we can so that our caregivers are who have friends and family that are going through this disease that they feel supported by us. We are also um, available through our 24 seven helpline. So no question um, can be unanswered. Please give us a call at any time. We are here to help you over 200 languages. And that's again 1-800-272-3900. Also, we can be able to assist you through our website. If you uh, check out our website, alz.org backslash San Diego, you can find more resources and also how to enroll in these free education programs. And also we have a great Science Hub app. If you do, if you have a, um, your, through your phone, you can be able to do a Google or through the Android or through the Apple app, you can be able to find us there through the ALZ. Science Hub app, where you can find the latest information on what we're doing locally and globally as far as research and trying to eradicate this disease. Thank you. Anna, thank you so much. Uh, when we were talking previously before this, you had some interesting information about how uh, Alzheimer's uh, affects different uh, demographic uh, groups of people. Can you uh, talk about that for a minute while we're in? Definitely, yes. Yeah. So we're seeing that more um, Latinos and Black Americans are um, disproportionately being affected by this disease. So Hispanics or Latinos are affected one and a half times more than the general population and African Americans are twice as likely to get the disease. So we are just trying to make sure that we advocate for more clinical research that is more diverse and covering these um, communities of color that historically have not participated in these clinical trials. So we're trying to do our best to fund uh, local research and global research to, to get more information on how to participate and how to really reach out to these very important communities. And uh, a question came in from our audience. I don't know if you're best to answer. If not, we can bring back our researchers. But what's the difference between Alzheimer's dementia and simple age-related forgetfulness, you know, which I seem to have, or at least my wife tells me that I have a lot of, is starting to forget things. So as we age, so does our brain. So we have to keep in mind that we, you know, we will be on occasion forgetting, you know, where we left our keys or where we parked. But the key thing here is if you remember where you parked, you know, shortly after you forgot, then that's a good sign. But if you don't remember where you parked or why you're at the store, how you got there, then that's a symptom to be concerned. And we definitely advise you to seek your um, healthcare provider information, go seek help with your medical professional so we can be able to find the distinction between what is normal aging and what is something that you need to be addressing rather quickly. And also your family members can also start noticing some things that are just not right. And so we encourage all those people to give us a call anyways uh, so we can be able to connect you with community resources and our care consultants right away. 
Thank you very much. We're going to bring uh, Tim and Gerald back on and we'll take some more questions. One of the questions we got was, would it be possible to summarize in lay language what we learned today? I'm going to give that an attempt because I'm one of the lay people here. And so if I can figure it out, anybody can figure it out. That's the way I look at it. So, but please, uh, I wanna put it out there for you all to uh, correct me. And Anna, please, uh, you can unmute yourself as well and we'll, uh, we may have some questions for you. So um, to summarize, the, the, our brains can get clogged up with stuff, right? These, these, uh, these plaques and these tangles and it gets clogged up with stuff and it prevents it from working correctly. In the same way that in Gerald, your example, an accident on the roadway will clog that up and prevent traffic from flowing smoothly. Many of uh, the, the studies that are going on right now are finding ways to better clean up that accident and the debris and things that are, that are on the road. Gerald, what you're looking at really is talking about how do we better teach our drivers, keep our drivers more focused, let's say on the road so that those accidents don't happen in the first place. Is that a very lay, is that an accurate, very, very lay, very surface description of what we were talking about? Sure, sure. I think uh, it, it uh, definitely touches upon some of the ideas we just discussed. We okay. want to try to understand the drivers not just the cars and the debris after they get into a wreck or the, uh, the cleanup crew that comes in after that. We want to get at what's, what's really producing the problem in the first place. Perfect. Um, and Tim, then on, on yours, what we're talking about is you're looking at um, uh, genes. Is it genes? Is that correct? The Sorla is a gene it's, is, or is it a protein? Yep, so it's a gene that makes a protein. That's okay. right. So the gene that makes the protein that is protecting the healthy cells in the brain from the bad things that uh, are trying to get in, again, the plaques and the, the tangles, either by preventing those from getting in in the first place or making them less destructive once they get into the brain. That's what you're yep. studying right now. Very nice. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Yeah, exactly. All right. And look, folks, if I can get this, you guys can all, uh, you can all get this. So we have some other questions that we didn't get to uh, before, one of which, and I don't know if this would be for Tim or Gerald, how does the mal splicing that, Gerald, you were talking about relate to the tau tangle formation? Tim, or I can take a stab at that. Uh, yeah, please go I, ahead. So, so, yeah, so uh, I think I think if that question, if, just to parse it down, if the the plaques that are occurring tend to precede the formation of, of tau. They're distinct genes. Uh, the plaques are produced by uh, APP gene products. That those are the proteins, and then they're cleaved by enzymes, so-called secretases, to produce the A beta peptides. At least that's the generalized uh, thinking about how this happens as compared to the tau tangles that comes from a completely different gene called MAPT, that's just the name of it. And so exactly how those two are linked is still not well understood. And it's important to note that the uh, MAPT and its tau products are not pathognomonic per se of Alzheimer's disease because it's also found in, for example, frontal temporal dementia a different dementia. So um, there is a link there somewhere, but uh, it, it's, it's still, I think, scientifically unclear uh, what that linkage is. And also uh, whether once you have, for example, the formation of tangles, whether you can really do something about it. There are uh, therapeutics that are being clinically assessed now to get rid of certain aspects of the tau tangles. Uh, I know some of those trials may have actually been discontinued already, but uh, there are others that are in the works. So we'll just have to wait and see what uh, emerges from that. Thank you. So that, that I let Gerald answer that because he could do a better job than I can. But I just want, wanted to add one more thing. So basically, um, once you start seeing the tau pathology, that's when you know your brain is in trouble. So it's a closer indicator of... Uh, of basically we have what's called a BRAC score. So the higher the score, the higher the pathology, and basically that can predict the severity of the disease. 
So thanks, Gerald. Thanks, Jim. Thank you both. Gerald, I wanna go back to you for another question from our audience about the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Um, are you looking at it to prevent Alzheimer's disease or is it something that might be beneficial for those who are already well down the Alzheimer's path? Um, I know you've talked about this quite a bit, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk about that again. Sure, it's both. And so prevention would be if you can get in there early enough, but of course, you know, that may not always be possible in a number of these different uh, degenerative diseases. However, it's important to note that the brain has the capacity to recover from uh, damage. And maybe that's best illustrated in stroke. And I'm sure all of us have known people who have suffered a stroke and uh, the initial uh, sequelae is not good, but over time and with, for example, physical therapy, et cetera, you can actually uh, recover from aspects of uh, the initial stroke. So that may be relevant to using a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, uh, you could stop the process and then allow the brain to recover uh, through its innate uh, recovery mechanisms. Uh, that's not proven, but at least that fits in with what we know about uh, any number of uh, injuries to the brain. It's not necessarily that uh, you have the worst case scenario from the start that stays with you, but in fact, you do often see recovery and that's the hope that uh, we, we could encounter some of that uh, it with such therapies like reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tim, a question that had come in for you about, um, is SORLA the only sort of protective gene in your lab that you've discovered or are there other genes you found that might contribute to the protection or also protect in and of themselves? Yeah, so I mean, basically that's our focus for now is, is, is SORLA. Um, so we are looking at related genes to SORLA. So one of them is called sorlin xn 27 that directly binds SORLA. So it actually enhances, or we, pre we, we predict it to enhance SORLA function uh, because it moves SORLA to the plasma membrane or to sites where SORLA might be protective in the cell, uh, which, which also includes the Golgi apparatus. Um, and so basically, um, we also look at genes that are related to SORLA, but not, might not have um, direct relevance to Alzheimer's disease in terms of being a, a risk factor. Got it. Uh, Anna, quick question for you. There's a couple questions up here about, and, and we'll open this to everybody as well, about um, the benefits of exercise, food, you know, diet, sleep, and those things in terms of preventing Alzheimer's in the, in the first place. Do you wanna take our first crack at that? Sure, I'll start. Um, so we've been hearing more that whatever is good for your heart is good for your brain. And so we will follow that um, as far as the, the nutrition goes to our system. So we wanna make sure that we have a balanced diet. We follow the Mediterranean or DASH diet. Um, we have a, a balanced um, food plate. You know, we want to make sure that we have um, all the, ne the necessary colors on the, on the plate, but also balancing that with exercise. We're seeing more and more research alluding to um, uh, more exercise every day instead of just, um, you know, once or three times a day or, or a week, excuse me. So we want to make sure that we have at least 30 minutes or 45 minutes of exercise daily so you can get that heart rate up and you actually start sweating. Um, and also being socially interactive with your neighbors or your family members, having that social interaction is also um, good for the brain. Um, picking up a new instrument, you know, learning a song um, or new language, things like that. So you can keep your brain active. Gerald, anything to add to that? Yeah, those are all good, uh, I think, prescriptions. Uh, activity is good, we're meant to be uh, both physically and mentally active. And so anything to, to promote those activities, I think can also benefit, uh, say, preventing dementia. And there's good, I think, uh, objective data that support that. It's not just an anecdotal thing. So continuing that uh, sort of um, activity throughout your life, combined with whatever therapeutics uh, emerge on the scene, is probably the best, the best uh, strategy. And Tim, I don't want to leave you out. Anything to add to that? No, that was great. Thank you very much. But uh, so exercise is the big one. 
So there, there's been extensive studies that do show that it, um, exercise does keep your brain healthy. Seems like every time we do one of these, uh, good diet and lots of exercise seems to be always the prescription for uh, preventing many of these diseases. So now that we are all able to be out and about uh, some more, let's uh, all remember for good diet and exercise. Okay, uh, we have gotten several questions about uh, the new uh, drugs, the new drug. Um, and uh, there is some controversy that we have read about, uh, about the drug, some that it works, some that it doesn't work. Um, the, one of the questions here is, can we briefly discuss this? Uh, Gerald, I'm gonna to turn to you first and just ask your thoughts on the new drug. What are the benefits of it? And what are some of the questions we maybe still have about it? Well, um, as Anna uh, mentioned, this is the first approval for a disease modifying therapy or DMT in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that, that is a milestone for everyone. And so now the question is, how does that enter medical care? And uh, from the standpoint of the scientific foundation for, for this agent, that, that is the puzzling side of it. The, the reason is that um, it's still not understood, uh, at least certainly not to me, but I think to many, uh, how Alzheimer's disease actually comes about and what the role of these A-beta plaques actually is. As you heard from Tim, you can have people that are perfectly normal uh, cognitively who have plaques. And so uh, to remove them, uh, is that really what uh, is the uh, therapeutic uh, path for, for Alzheimer's disease? And the reason that I think there was and is controversy is that there've been 20 years of attempts to do this in myriad clinical trials that failed. And in, in fact, I think, of course, this is all public uh, domain information. Biogen's own trials, one of them was a failure. And in fact, the second one was initially deemed a failure and it wasn't until they uh, did a subgroup analysis that they saw something that might be okay. It's just that in the context of two decades of failed trials, is that really a success? And that's something that will have to be sorted out uh, in, I think, in, in the clinical uh, application of this, of this agent. I think an additional aspect that we'll all have to watch is are there adverse events that are associated uh, with this agent in the clinical trials? There were significant uh, issues. So all, all of the clinicians who will be involved in prescribing this will need to follow their patients closely for potential problems. So that, that just puts sort of a, uh, you know, a balanced look at what, what's out there. Uh, we don't know at this point if you use this agent in say a more advanced Alzheimer's disease patient, whether something else uh, will happen or whether nothing will happen. These are uh, issues that were not addressed in the clinical trials because of the nature of uh, the patient population used for the trials. And yet the, uh, the label, so to speak, what uh, the approval was for the uh, drug is any Alzheimer's disease person could potentially receive this. So this is all going to have to be sorted out in the future. And you know, what, we all hope that it works and that it will not produce uh, you know, adverse events. And so we just need to be circumspect about what actually took place and um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, did this, do we think that this research, is it, is it good or bad for Alzheimer's research? I mean, it sounds like it's a little step forward, but could there be a danger with Alzheimer's research with, with this? Well, I think scientists and physicians have argued both sides. Um, maybe it's good because you have an approved agent that can be used, but maybe it's bad because now a lot of the patients that might go into a trial might say, oh, I'm not going to be the placebo group. <clears throat> I'd rather have the, the medicine. So that might potentially change it. There'll be other, I think, arguments that, oh yes, we now understand uh, Alzheimer's disease because this shows that it's due to this amyloid. But yet, if you look at the data, it, it really uh, is equivocal. And it's, it's notable that of the uh, 11 uh, FDA members that were advisory board members, uh, they voted 10-0-1 10 no, 
zero approved and one uncertain. So there, there's definitely this, this um, issue out there of, you know, what, what is this? What do we actually have here? And again, you know, as just, just to reiterate, it is approved. So, you know, I think that's going to be really where, you know, the understanding will come from. We just don't know if it's going to work as, uh, you know, the approval would kind of indicate that it should and, you know, could. We'll just have to see. Can I just add one more thing? So I think um, at the end of the day, I think this is going to give useful information regardless if it's working or not. I think uh, basically if Aduhelm does have effects on plaques, but we're not seeing significant change at a certain stage of treatment at a certain level, then we have useful information. So basically if we're lowering a beta at a certain stage, but there's no very little or no change in the uh, memory decline, um, I think basically we need to also do something else in addition or uh, you know, some type of supplement, supplemental treatment uh, in addition. So. I would also like to add that um, although this, this approval of this treatment is not perfect, um, we are seeing that it will help invigorate the field and generate more innovation in the field. So we are excited about that. There's definitely uh, more to come. And as we get more information, please check out our website with, with the latest of what we hear. Um, and we're hopeful for this new treatment. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much to our presenters and thank you all for joining us. There were some questions we didn't get a chance to get to. And for those people, um, if our researchers don't mind, and generally they don't, uh, we'll email those questions to our researchers and uh, get a response and send it back to you. As always, our presentation was recorded and will be emailed to everyone who registered. We so, so appreciate you taking an active role in learning about our research. So please feel free to share this with others who might be interested in our work. And you can learn about our other research at Future Insights events. Here is a list of those that are upcoming in the next few months. And if you would like to learn more about or contribute to any of our research, please contact me at either the email or phone number that will come up on your screen. Thank you all for attending today. Again, please feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues. And thank you so much for your interest in our science here at Sanford Burnham Preface. Have a great day.